Yeah. Um, so I had a wonderful 38 year career in the national parks and I'll show you some of the, my park assignments here in a minute. Um, but it was, I was really fortunate to work for a, an organization of people who really had a great mission and believed in what they were doing, conserving uh, important national resources. And uh, also working alongside many great volunteers as well. Um, so I retired from Acadia National Park after working there 12 years as superintendent. Uh, I was also superintendent of Black Canyon of the Gunnison National Park and Cura Conti National Recreation Area here in Colorado, uh, and deputy superintendent of Rocky Mountain National Park. I spent a year in Washington, D.C. in a training program, and before that I was superintendent of Fort Scott National Historic Site and uh, a management assistant at Cuyahoga Valley in Ohio. So, um, and I thought I would just throw the mission up here of the National Park Service for those folks who might not be familiar with it. It's really to preserve the natural and cultural resources and values for the enjoyment, education, and inspiration of this and future generations. And that came from a Act of Congress in 1916. Um, and I also thought I would show a typical park organization, the superintendent and deputy, usually ob obviously were at the top of the park organization. And we had employees in these various divisions or departments, interpretation, resource management, visitor protection, facilities maintenance and administration. My first assignment as a superintendent was in Fort Scott, Kansas at Fort Scott Internet or Fort Scott National Historic Site. Uh, it was my first real experience in a small town. Uh, I was surprised to learn after just being there a couple weeks, people knew who I was and knew where we lived even, which really surprised me. Uh, and I guess that's small town America. I'd been in the newspaper, of course, and uh, people right away started talking word of mouth where I lived and so on and so forth. And uh, that was a nice lesson in small town politics, if you will. So the National Historic Site was a restored uh, frontier military fort uh, sitting on a bluff over the Marmoton River in Kansas. Um, the gentleman there on the left in the infantry uniform is actually a park ranger. And uh, the, the woman and little girl there walking across the parade ground. Uh, that's actually my wife, Barb, and my daughter, Kelly, who were some of our best volunteers there at Fort Scott. We did costumed interpretation, or what some people call living history, where we wore uh, replica uniforms and clothing uh, from the time period and tried to interpret that time period to visitors coming through the fort. So the fort historically had dragoons, which were the forerunners of the cavalry, mounted troops, and infantry, both there at the fort, historically. Uh, so when visitors came through the fort, they would encounter uh, somebody from the infantry or the dragoons, and they could talk to them and learn more about the time period. And it really was a, a interesting way for people to uh, learn more about Fort Scott and its history. We had a number of weekend major events and, uh, you know, for when we actually had dragoons or infantry spending the night at the fort, we would prepare meals in the mess hall and bake bread in the bakehouse and do gardening and those kinds of things, all for the benefit of the visiting public. We used a number of volunteers, including volunteers who would bring their horses. Uh, obviously, this group was portraying the, a group of dragoons uh, and doing exercises on the parade ground. Um, we had a number of weekend events where they would spend the night. Uh, and when they would do that, they would often walk guard duty around the perimeter of the fort, uh, including around the tall grass prairie area that was on one side of the National Historic Site. And otherwise, it was pretty close to downtown Fort Scott, which happened to be on the other side of a plaza. One night we had a 
dragoon walking around the perimeter on guard duty and he heard something in the in the prairie and he lowered his rifle thinking that it might be somebody playing a trick on him and he said identify yourself and out of the prairie came a naked man and woman with their hands up and said don't shoot don't shoot and uh turned out they had come over from one of the bars as it closed in the middle of the night and uh, were looking for a little privacy in the wrong place. Uh, from Fort Scott, I moved, uh, the family moved to Washington, D.C. for one year of a training program. Uh, I worked for the Congress for half of that year and the director of the National Park Service for half of the year. And uh, it was a great way to really understand the role of Congress and uh, Washington office in managing national parks. And then from there, I transferred uh, to deputy superintendent at Rocky Mountain National Park here in Colorado, uh, where I was the chief of operations for uh, seven years. Um, I'm sure many of you have been to Rocky Mountain National Park. It's 415 square miles uh, with one third of the park being above tree line or alpine tundra. Um, it's really, truly spectacular place, as you know, and the Trail Ridge Road goes across the top from Estes Park to Grand Lake, a distance of about 45 miles, and uh, one third of that road is above treeline. And it's a great place up there on the tundra to see the magnificent wildlife of the National Park, uh, elk and uh, coyotes and deer and other animals, sometimes bears. Um, but it was uh, a spectacular environment with uh, wildflowers on the tundra and clear mountain streams and beautiful high mountain lakes and uh, 100 and, or 350 miles of hiking trail to get to those great places. It's quite a, a contrast for us to move from Washington DC and kind of a typical suburb and commuting by train into the office, I was, and uh, moved from there to Estes Park, Colorado. We lived in this house that's shown there and we would have elk and deer in the yard a lot of the day. In fact, you never know what you were gonna see when you woke up in the morning and looked out the door. Um, all of these pictures were animals in our yard uh, that the fawns were born right there on our property. And that was quite a thrill. Um, we, as I said, often would have animals in the yard right at, during the day. That little black speck there was a miniature dachshund we had, and she would be in a wire pen out there that we just turned, made into a circle. And often the animals would walk right up to the pen and look at her wondering what she was, I'm sure. And, uh, she would bark and sometimes cause them to run, which I'm sure made her very proud, but. Uh, the upper right picture there is elk outside our, right off of our deck. Our deck was pretty much flush with the ground and uh, often the elk would walk right across that deck trying to get to a bird feeder. We had this one elk that came back year after year um, and uh, my daughter said it had a bad hair day. It was, uh, one of the antlers was deformed and would turn down as you can see and, you know, they lose their antlers in the fall, grow them back in the spring, and every year it would grow back deformed. Um, the elk had trouble grazing because of that, because the one deformed antler would hit the ground before its mouth could reach the ground. So it learned how to turn its head sideways and eat um, out of the side of its mouth. But the curious thing to us was it came back that way every year. Well, the deputy superintendent oversees all daily operations of the park. We had, uh, you know, whether it was resource management or uh, campground management, spring opening of the uh, plowing operations, wildland fire, emergency services, operating the entrance stations and so forth. So that was all under the purview of the deputy superintendent, which was a really big job there at uh, Rocky Mountain, but it was a terrific job. A lot of really interesting things going on and uh, pretty exciting. I mentioned 350 miles of trail. I decided to make it a personal goal to hike all of those in three years so I could really get to know the park. So my son and I would do a lot of those trails and the family would do many of them as well. Uh, 
my son and I did some backpacking overnight trips in the park. And uh, it was a great way to learn more about Rocky Mountain and uh, know the areas inside the park. Um, so Ranger Operations was a big deal at Rocky Mountain with uh, over 3 million visitors, a lot uh, going on, as I mentioned. Um, I would monitor the park radio on the weekends just to see what was going on and see if I needed to go into the park for any reason. And uh, one day I turned on the radio and there was this traffic going between park dispatch and some rangers up at the Fern Lake cabin, which is shown there on the right. We had a number of patrol cabins that were back in the park for uh, official purposes. And uh, there were some rangers up there and they were calling back to dispatch asking where Kurt Oliver was. He was the district ranger. And uh, they said, the dispatch said he had just left headquarters. And they said, well, when will he be up at Fern Lake Cabin? And they said, well, that would be about an hour and a half. And uh, the rangers up there asked dispatch, did he have the item? And uh, dispatch said, yes, he's got the item. Well, of course, I was wondering what is the item and what did that mean? Uh, I thought possibly it meant uh, a body bag or something. They did not want to use that terminology on the radio. And therefore, there may have been a serious incident up near the Fern Lake cabin. So I called dispatch and I said, what's going on at Fern Lake cabin? And they said, uh, oh, their rangers are having a sh small meeting up there. And I said, okay, so what's the item? And they said, oh, it's a peach pie that Lori Oliver has made. And they were all anxiously awaiting for their slice of peach pie, which they called the item. Um, but one of the greatest things about Rocky Mountain is the wildlife. And uh, many people come to the park just for the reason to see wildlife. And whenever there would be a group of wildlife near the road, you'd very quickly end up in what we called an animal jam with people just leaving their cars and heading out into the meadow to take pictures. And uh, it sometimes created gridlock, but everybody was usually having a good time. So elk and uh, bighorn sheep and beer, bears and what have you uh, were all part of the environment there at Rocky Mountain. Uh, we had a lot of wildlife management activities, uh, including every spring we would band uh, peregrine falcon chicks for as part of a big research project and uh, be able to track them. And um, that was really a, an important project, but uh, we also had bighorn sheep that would on a daily basis pretty much cross the main park road to get to a mineral lick and a pond on the other side of the road. And uh, so we had a group of volunteers that would actually stop traffic, kind of like school patrol and let the students cross the road. In this case, we'd let the sheep uh, move across the road and then let traffic resume. Uh, the people in the front always got great photographs and, and great views. The people in the back tended to get a little more unhappy. Another big research project we had going on was black bears. And we had about a dozen bears with radio collars on uh, so we could track their movements over time. Uh, the gentleman there in the green coat on the right, he's got an antenna uh, and he's actually listening for uh, telemetry from bears and he can identify where they are using that telemetry. So in the winter, they would take uh, official trips to the bear dens in order to uh, take some measurements, uh, take a blood sample, check for the general health of the bear, and then also to put new batteries in the radio collars. So the way they would do that would be to hike and snowshoe using the antenna to guide them to where they thought the den was and then dig uh, through the snow if there was a lot of snow to find the opening. So I went on a couple of these trips and um, this particular trip, um, you can see that the sci scientist Hank there is in the blue pants. He's actually leaning into the den looking to see whether there's uh, an adult bear and any cubs and what the situation is before we tranquilize, in this case, the adult bear. That aluminum pole you see in the upper left-hand corner is what we call a jab stick. 
it had a spring loaded syringe on it and uh, the scientists would jab the, the adult bear and then we'd wait 15 minutes and, and uh, he would go back into the den and put a rope around the, the adult. And if there were any cubs, as there were in this case, they, he'd hand the cubs out rather than tranquilize them. We were just to keep them warm. Uh, that meant putting them inside the coat and um, uh, trying to keep them calm and warm. A particular cub I had, which was a little male, he did not want any part of being in my coat, and he kept scratching and scratching and trying to get out of that uh, coat. But in the end, uh, they they get the adult bear out and um, weigh the bear, weigh the cubs, uh, take some measurements, look at their teeth. Um, and take a blood sample and then put in a new battery in the collar and uh, then put put the bears back in the den and cover the opening and then we leave and uh, over a period of about 10 years uh, Hank learned an awful lot about the bear situation in Rocky Mountain National Park. We also had about 25 head of uh, horses and mules that we would use in the park particularly for ranger patrol and maintenance activities way back in the backcountry. Uh, we had pack animals and we actually had an animal packer on staff to uh, help get that equipment into the back country. One day I decided to take a horse patrol with this ranger, Jim Coretti, and uh, he was going to go up to Lake Nakoni and Nanita, uh, some distance of 22 miles round trip. And so uh, I agreed to go with him and he agreed to provide a horse. And so we got to the trailhead at six o'clock in the morning and He's got a horse for me named Beamer, and uh, we get we start up the trail, and uh, Beamer uh, it tends or turns out to be a new horse to the park. He was donated by a rancher who was going to retire, and he thought his horse would enjoy retirement in a national park. So we took Beamer, and this was one of the first trips that Beamer had been on. And uh, I'm riding up the trail with Jim Coretti and. We get to a creek and Beamer refuses to cross the creek and, and Coretti says uh, we got to make him get across the creek. So we're pulling and tugging and pushing and what have you, get him across the creek. I get on, ride a little further, we come to a bridge and the same thing happens. He won't cross the bridge. So we get off, get Beamer across the bridge and then we get a little later on a uh, kind of a ledge area, cliff area, and Beamer freezes up there. And at this point, I'm a little unhappy that that I've got Beamer. So I said to Jim Credi, I said, hey, Jim, I got a couple of questions here. Why does the park have Beamer, number one? And number two, why did you bring Beamer for me today? And uh, he says, well, we, we didn't know if he was adaptable to the national park or not, so we're really giving him a tryout. Well, that was Beamer's first and last summer at Rocky Mountain. He didn't come back for a second season. We always had uh, search and rescues uh, every summer. We would have as many as 50 major search and rescues. Major was defined by any rescue that cost more than $5,000. And that typically would be uh, the use of helicopters would run the bill up like that. We had to be prepared for high mountain technical rescues and also just uh, rescuing people nearby trails on this wheeled litter you see up there in the left corner and get them to a waiting ambulance, uh, usually taken to the hospital in Estes Park or flown to the hospitals down in the valley. Um, we did have occasional water rescues uh, and um, so had to be trained for that. So our, we had a lot of expertise on our staff. I have that three X there because we had uh, one individual we rescued three times in the same week. And uh, after the third time of rescuing this guy that kept getting himself into trouble, um, we cited him for disorderly conduct and the federal magistrate made him pay for the rescues and uh, banned him from the park for two years, which we all thought was worthy uh, sentence in that case. There was one particularly memorable rescue in Rocky when I was there, it was up on Hallett Peak where that arrow is. There were three climbers going up the steepest uh, vertical wall there and the lead climber fell 
landed on top of the other two, knocked them to the ledge below, and one was uh, seriously injured, back injury. And so we had to mount a really very technical rescue, took 22 people to be flown to the top of Mount Hallett with all their equipment in order to raise those people to the top of Mount Hallett, and which point we would fly them off. So the helicopter made 12 trips up to the top of Hallett. And on the last trip had one rescuer left to go and his equipment. And uh, the pilot said he wanted extra fuel on board and they put extra fuel on the helicopter. And then they did the weight calculations and the helicopter manager who worked for the park to oversee aircraft operations, she said, you're overweight, you're gonna to have to take off some of that fuel. And he said, well, I'm not overweight. He said, uh, um, I need to be able to fly from the top of Hallett Peak back to Fort Collins where his daughter was having a piano recital and he wanted to make it back in time. So uh, anyway, they argued about it for a while and pretty soon the pilot said, listen, uh, it's my helicopter, I'm the pilot. I say I can make it up there safely and I'm, and I'm gonna go. So he did, he took off and flew up there and lost control as he approached the summit of Mount Hallett, or Hallett Peak, crashed the helicopter, destroyed it. Fortunately, nobody was seriously injured um, but it could have been much, much worse. Then we had to get a bigger helicopter in the next day to fly the debris out and to finish the operation that was started the night before. While I was at Rocky Mountain, there was one, what we call a project fire, which means it's big enough. We have to bring resources from around the United States, firefighters, uh, even uh, what were called Hot Shots, some of the best of the best firefighters. And uh, it's a really big operation. You have uh, several hundred people on the fire line. You have to plan logistics and take care of all their needs in addition to uh, uh, fighting the fire. And it's, so it's a really big deal, usually with uh, helicopters and other kinds of aircraft involved. And uh, we also have contractors that come in with mobile kitchens. They prepare the meals for the several hundred firefighters. And uh, they also have mobile showers units and other things to take care of the firefighters in their spike camp. Uh, so the superintendent and I went over there to uh, that camp one evening just to thank the firefighters and have dinner with them. And uh, you could tell, just take a look at this picture and the faces on these people. And you can tell that they've been uh, on the fire lines, it's hot, it's smoky, it's soot all over them. Uh, you can see scratches on their arms. It's really hard work and, uh, and they put in many hours. And then when they get back to the camp for dinner, they usually eat about uh, two or three portions of dinner, uh, stocking up for the next day. Um, but it's, uh, it's a lot of uh, dedicated people who man those fire lines. A popular destination in Rocky was the Alpine Visitor Center at 12,200 feet. And um, in the summer, of course, many people would go there on a daily basis. Uh, one winter, we had an unusually large amount of snow and we had to literally dig the uh, visitor center out of the snow drifts. Uh, the snow went right to the peak of the roof. You can, as my son there, walk right to the peak of the roof across the snow and stand on the roof. And uh, we used these rotary snow plows as seen there on the right. Uh, they could throw snow a couple hundred feet and uh, to open the road. And then we used bulldozers and a lot of hand crews to dig out the buildings when we got close enough. Uh, you can see that the snow is just packed right up against the doors and windows that has to be dug out. And then those three people up there on that mound, that's the visitor center underneath there. They're actually digging tunnels into the windows to get light into the building uh, to open it up. And um, uh, that was a pretty unusual year, but um, drifts could always be more than 20 feet tall. In fact, you see this uh, roadside drift there, that's probably uh, 15 to 18 feet tall. That's Barb again, acting as my model for scale. Um, one unusual event we had while I was there was uh, 
Pope John Paul II uh, came to Camp St. Malo, which is on the very edge of the National Park. Uh, it's a Catholic youth camp. He was in Denver for the Youth Summit. Some of you may remember that. And the Pope is treated as the head of state. So he's treated just like uh, uh, a president of another country. Um, and so he was going to arrive by presidential helicopter uh, loaned for the purpose to bring him up to Camp St. Malo. Well, this was the biggest thing ever to happen to Camp St. Malo. So they worked for 24 hours a day to get ready for the Pope's visit, including painting much of the place inside and out. And they got some uh, expert gardeners to plant some really elaborate gardens right along the parking lot uh, as a kind of a uh, first impression of beautiful flowers and these nice designs and what have you. And uh, the National Park Service was involved in the security planning for this event because uh, he was going to hike from Camp, Camp St. Malo into the National Park. And so our rangers would have to be involved in uh, helping with security. So the chief ranger went to Camp St. Malo the day before the Pope was to arrive for what we called a dress rehearsal. And they were uh, talking about last minute preparations and they had the helicopters uh, come up to the camp so they would know exactly where they were going and where to land and so forth. And uh, I went with the chief ranger for this last closeout meeting. And uh, pretty soon we heard the helicopters coming and they had a Black Hawk uh, come in first. He didn't land, he just kind of swooped in. But then the big presidential helicopter did come in for a landing right there on the parking lot. And we were all standing back far enough to, but close enough to watch. And um, as that helicopter landed, you could imagine the rotor wash of something that big. Anyway, all of those plants, the flowers and the peat moss and everything just became a tornado. And uh, we had peat moss inside our clothing and hair, and it was just a mess. We were all running for cover. <laughs> And in the end, um, that helicopter took off and the gardeners came running out trying to repair the damage. And we said, you know, it, it's just going to happen again tomorrow. And, and their response was, well, that's OK. Maybe he'll see it from the air before he lands. Uh, from Rocky Mountain, I transferred to Black Canyon and the Gunnison National Park and um, Chiricani National Recreation Area. I was superintendent there for seven years. Um, Black Canyon, some of you I'm sure have been there, is 2,700 2, feet deep in its deepest place and only 40 feet wide in its narrowest place. Um, but people really enjoyed seeing it. Uh, when I was uh, transferred there, it was Black Canyon of the Gunnison National Monument. And you know, national monuments are established by a presidential proclamation all other units of the national park system are created by an act of co Congress. Um, anyway, this was the painted wall, very famous uh, landmark in the park. And uh, I was being interviewed by a reporter one time on uh, a video for television. And he said, what's the primary rock we see here? And I said, schist. And he said, oh no, we can't say that on TV. You gotta come up with another word, but um, the other kind of funny thing was that uh, uh, some people would go drive through the scenic part of the park and come back to the visitor center and they would say, you know, uh, the park is beautiful. The, the uh, canyon is just spectacular, but where is the monument? We didn't see any monument. And they were looking for something like this on the right here from a picture I took at a cemetery, but it's a just a concrete uh, marker of some kind, and they were thinking that that's what they needed to see. Um, anyway, there wasn't such a thing at Black Canyon. And while I was there, we came up with a proposal to add land to the National Monument and make it a national park. And so I was invited to go to the Oval Office the day that President Clinton signed that act making Black Canyon a national park. And um, that was a pretty thrilling experience. The rest of the people in this picture are uh, two senators and a congressman from Colorado. You may recognize some of them, but um, that was a good day in, in Washington, D.C. for Black Canyon, and uh, I certainly enjoyed being there. Um, 
there was a lot of media interest in that. And uh, I told you the funny story about Schist, but um, there were stories in 58 different newspapers about Black Canyon. So national parks make a, a big, uh, are, are very popular and make a big splash. Well, from there, I transferred to Acadia National Park and um, where I was superintendent for 12 years. And it was such a beautiful place and such a wonderful community and a park with a lot of really good challenges. I just decided I didn't want to move to another park during that time period. And I just stayed there until I retired. Acadia National Park in Maine is made up of about 60 or pieces of 60 islands totaling about 48,000 acres, which makes it one of the five smallest national parks. Although it's one of the 10 most visited with over 3 million visitors a year. Uh, one of the most popular features is Thunder Hole. And on a, any given day, if the tide is right and the uh, surf is uh, big enough, you get these incredible geyser-like splashes uh, there at Thunder Hole and it makes a big noise at the same time. So um, there's always a crowd there uh, taking pictures of these events. One of the other things that Acadia is known for are the historic ladder trails. Uh, so these are iron rung ladder trails uh, built over a hundred years ago. And uh, so they're now considered historic and we maintain those. Um, the the most challenging of these iron trails, iron rung trails is the precipice. It's 1100 feet of vertical climb up many of these ladders. And uh, as you can see in the photo on the right, the, the woman up there is saying the trail is only this wide up here. And um, there's some exposure obviously. And you see the photo on the left there in situations like that, we put, uh, they put iron rungs to, to hold on to for safety purposes. And you can see it's quite a ways down. The park road is down there in the distance. Well, my wife, Barb, uh, really didn't want to go up there, but uh, decided that she had to go at least once. And uh, so this is our son-in-law, Matt here, who, who's helping her through some of the trickier areas. And um, I'm, of course, taking pictures. But uh, when she got to the top, she said, okay, I've done it once, never again. <laughs> so, but a lot of people uh, think this is one of the neatest experiences of their park stay. And many families will come back and do it over and over again, um, just for the memories. A big event while I was there at Acadia was the weekend that the first family, President Obama and Michelle uh, visited with their kids and stayed in the area for three days and did a lot of activities in the park. Here we greeted them up on Cadillac Mountain. And um, uh, the funny story there is you see a lapel pin on Barb there on, on her blouse. Uh, the Secret Service had us wear lapel pins that meant that we had been uh, passed our background check and we were safe to be within 25 feet of the president. And they had, of course, very tight security and. Um, and Barb uh, somehow lost that lapel pin early on. And she went to the Secret Service and said, uh, I can't find my lapel pin. I need another one. And they said, no, we don't give out another one. You'd better go find it, which fortunately she did. But the other uh, interesting activity we did with the Obamas, we took them out on the park boat out on Frenchman Bay. And uh, the park boat is an old... Uh, replica or not a replica it's a lobster boat and um, we went out for an hour hour and a half on the on the bay but the security was amazing we had six of these gunboats formed a circle around us not really close they were probably a half mile off so anywhere we went this circle of patrol boats was with us we had a coast guard helicopter overhead and we had this guy on the boat uh, called a rescue swimmer from the coast guard and these guys are trained to dive into the worst possible conditions to save a life. And uh, he was all prepared. He had his fins and his wetsuit on and his, everything else he would need. And he stood right there on the edge of the gunnel of the boat. And he would have been in the water just in a split second had one of the Obamas gone overboard. So um, 
there were a lot of pictures taken of that uh, event by the news media and started, they, media started asking questions like, why does the, suit, the ranger there have a vest on, a life jacket, and the Obamas don't? And I think they were trying to catch them violating some kind of law. But anyway, the, there were really two answers to that question. At least that's what I've maintained. The, the, the official answer was they didn't need to have life jackets on, but they needed to have them handy. And they were, they were all available right there for the family on the boat. And I was just wearing one for, to set an example. And uh, that was the official answer. The unofficial answer was, well, um, there was a rescue swimmer on board and had one of the Obamas gone overboard, they would have been right there in the water with them and saved their life and uh, everything would have been fine. But had I gone overboard, the swimmer would have probably said, uh, oh, uh, Captain, the superintendent just went overboard, you better turn around. The last thing I, I wanted to kind of share with you since uh, you folks are all supporters of land conservation, um, was a, a major threat to Acadia National Park that I had to deal with when I was there. It's on the map on the left there, this 3,200 acre piece in red was owned by a family in Italy. And it was clearly the biggest threat to Acadia National Park of my tenure there. And at one point they were planning 800 houses, uh, an aircraft landing strip, a golf course and two resorts. And that would have, as you can see that, piece of land really went right into the heart of that part of the park and it would have totally changed the character of the visit to that part of Acadia National Park. And so I was really concerned about that and I spent a lot of time trying to locate the owners, trying to communicate with them and they were being very secretive and they really didn't want to talk to me. Well, in 2008, as you might recall, there was a big recession in real estate housing bust and so forth. And so their plans really did not appear like they were gonna be very practical. And uh, I ended up uh, trying to meet with them to talk about purchasing the land. And um, they said that if I would travel to the Boston airport on a certain date, I could meet with uh, Mr. Modena, the family representative. And so I did, we agreed to meet under a, a restaurant sign in the main lobby of the airport at nine o'clock on Wednesday morning. And when I arrived there, there was a guy there standing under that sign and it turned out he was Mr. Modena. And we talked for an hour or so and uh, he said the land wasn't for sale, but that it was worth uh, at least $50 million before it was developed and uh, or approved for development. So, uh, and I said, well, we would never be able to raise $50 million and he said, well, it's not really for sale anyway at that point. Well, when we parted company, I asked him to give me his contact information, which I didn't have. And also if he would consider selling part of the land, what I really wanted was the South half, the lower half of that, that went right next to the national park as it existed at that time. And uh, he said he didn't think that family was interested, but that he would, uh, tell them about that possibility of selling it to the park, part of it. And um, a couple, few weeks later, I got a phone call from Mr. Modine and he said, well, maybe they would be interested in selling. And uh, he said that um, they would sell the south half of that piece of land, 3,000 acres for $19 million. And I thought, well, at least the price is coming down in the right direction. I still think that's more than it's worth. But, um, and coincidentally, uh, a few weeks after that, a gentleman approached me at a cocktail party and, and asked me about this land that, and, uh, that I had gotten a lot of publicity about. And uh, I said, yeah, I think they might be willing to sell, but I'm not sure. And he said, well, what, what do you think it would cost? And I said, well, again, I don't have an appraisal or anything, but I think it would be at least $10 million. And he, at that point he said, well, I could buy that. And uh, I didn't know if he was serious or not, but it turned out he was. And uh, he ended up purchasing that land for $12 million. And it was about three months later when he actually uh, closed on the deal and uh, he was gonna donate that land to the park uh, as a gift. 
And uh, before he did that, though, he said, what else do you think we ought to do? And I said, well, what do you what do you think? And he said, well, I'd be glad to uh, be willing to develop some facilities if the park wants them and uh, make that part of the gift. Well, in the end, he uh, uh, paid for uh, the development to national park standards of a campground, a little visitor center and a maintenance building and some trails and bike paths. And um, the whole gift was worth probably $40 million he gave to the people of the United States. And it was a marvelous, spectacular gift. One of my goals during that time was uh, to get kids uh, more interested in the outdoors, less interested in electronics. And so we worked a lot on getting youth uh, connected to the park. And uh, I was thrilled one day when I heard this family uh, down by the seashore come back uh, to their parents and say, you know, this is the coolest, best vacation ever. And it really, um, inspired me to keep up that work with uh, youth and our future visitors. So some of the great visitor enthusiasm for national parks made our job so much easier and uh, volunteers and uh, great dedicated employees and uh, partner groups, all of those things made our work uh, easier in preserving Acadia National Park and other national parks for the long term. And um, so after 38 years working for the national parks, I retired and um, I think it was a great honor and privilege to work uh, as superintendent of these great resources and uh, help inspire future generations uh, of people who would protect the national parks.